We're at the 2009 Mid-Atlantic Grass Finish Conference. And we're watching Meet the Farmer TV. Today on Meet the Farmer TV, the Mid-Atlantic Grass Finish Livestock Conference in Stanton, Virginia. Meet the Farmer TV is made possible by Planet Earth Diversified, Melly Productions, and Leslie P. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design. T&E Meets, Clemson University, West Virginia University. In the Kitchen Magazine, serving the community and everyone who loves good food. Culpepper's Channel 21, helping to preserve the agricultural history of Virginia. And Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture. Here we are at T&E Meats and we're going to break beef. Joe, Dale and Ronnie are going to show us how to turn the live animal into the primal cuts. Then later on, we'll take those primal cuts into the finished cuts right at the demonstration. Arugula to zucchini at the White House. Save the family farm. In the kitchen. In the end, the bill passed. It's a model for local food production. It's for locally grown food. It's about market access. Plants don't have personalities. I got one. <laughs> <laughs> I call it the new American agriculture. And our whole agriculture education system is going to change. We have a great solution to some of these uh, crises that we're now facing. And you're watching. And you're watching. And you're watching. And you're watching. Meet the Farmer TV. So Joe, what we have here is the front quarter. This is the front quarter of a grass-fed polyface beef. Yes, and so what we're going to do, we're going to put it on the saw and we're going to cut it into a square chuck. Okay. Now, remove part of the shank and and uh, the rib section. This is Andy. We're going to we're going to break the rib section from the front chuck section. You cut up, you leave the last seven ribs hanging there. That's why your standing rib roast, which is right here, always has seven ribs. You typically buy them in three, four, or seven. All right, what you do to separate your chuck from your rib eye here, you come up five ribs. One, two, three, four, five, and go above it to the six, the bottom of the six. Make your cut, spin it around. Make your cut to separate it. All right, what you just cut off here is your whole chuck, which is up on the saw, where you can get your get your soup bones, your shank, your brisket, and your chuck roast. This here is where you can get your skirt steak, your short ribs, and your rib steaks, ribeye standing rib roast. So this, this is cutting your short ribs now? That's correct. See, once you, look here, Frank, this is, um, see how we got an inspection mark? That's our establishment number, 7420. That goes on every piece of meat that goes out of this plant. We have to have our establishment number. So they, they stamp all the primal cuts, all the quarters, with it. Um, and then later on, when we cut it and package it in individual pieces, we've got that same establishment number as on all of our labels. It's, that's part of the USDA inspection process. We're not allowed to let meat leave this plant that doesn't have that inspection number on it. Some of the early center of meat cutting in America was in New York. That was where the money was. So that's where steakhouses started. Um, that's like, we have big ar ar arguments, what's the difference between a ribeye and a Delmonico? Where, where's Delmonico come from? Well, Delmonico was an Italian guy back in the 1880s that ha had the first big name steakhouse in America, and that was up in Manhattan. And they served a lot of that particular piece of meat, uh, and so that's where it got its name. So there's just a whole mixed history of where these names come from. All right, right here's where you make your separation and get your short loin from your round. 
if you're looking for your knuckle there, you cut at keep at the top of your top sirloin there. You've taken the, the live animal down to the primal cuts. What happens next? Well, we're gonna take that animal, Mike, and we'll put it on a table, put it back together again like a jigsaw puzzle, and then one by one, we'll take those individual primals down to the individual steaks and other cuts so that the, the conferees can see really from soup to nuts how we cut an animal. So what we're gonna see now is a reassembled uh, portion of the animal and then we'll find out how you get the tenderloins and New York strips and, and where the hamburgers come out of it. That's correct. That's, that's what we will see tonight at the conference center. Yes. Right. Well, let's go. Okay. I am Ian Michelinus from KwaZulu-Natal, which is a province in South Africa. And I'm a certified holistic management educator, and you're watching Meet the Farmer TV. This is the 2009 uh, grass finish livestock conference it's the Mid-Atlantic Conference, and the purpose of this is to uh, bring in the best speakers in regards to finishing uh, cattle or livestock on, on forage or grass, and to uh, main objective is to learn as much as possible as far as the production of the forage, forage systems, the species it's used, and so forth, but also to talk about other issues such as marketing and distribution, of uh, the product, securing that market, and what are, you, what are the producer's goals, and, and so forth. Uh, we also are talking about the meat cuts, uh, which is very important. We had a uh, meat cutting and cooking demonstration for grass-fed beef, and that was an excellent program because we identified a lot of different cuts of uh, meat that can be cut out of the carcass and used for different uh, reasons or purposes and so forth and also how to cut the meat to maintain its uh, tenderness. Uh, we also talked about some issues regarding uh, the, uh, the, the marketing, as I indicated, and penetrating that market and, and where to go uh, to uh, sell your product, how important it is to do that, and so forth. We also have some other individuals here, like we had a tour, farm tour, Joel Salatin. Joel, we visited his farm to let him express and show how he handles the cattle on the grass as far as rotating the cattle and what body condition the cattle should be in and so forth for slaughter. Um, we, me, yeah. Let me give you a little background on the conference. This came out of uh, something that John Andre did last year in Clemson. David Fiskin from our Shandoe Valley AREC and I attended John's conference last year and we we're so excited about it after we came back we said we're going to do this in Virginia. So we got with John and we put together a regional committee for this conference and it represents uh, four different states. And uh, we planned this conference and our vision is that this conference would be presented either annually or biannually, so every two years. We have not set the date for next year, but we hope to do another one. The response was just overwhelming for this conference. We had 250 spots available for this conference and we had over 350 people want to come. We had to turn turned a lot of people down that wanted to come to this conference and um, we've heard great comments so far about the conference and, and we hope we can really finish it up with a bang today. One of the goals of this conference is there's been a lot of grass finish conference in the past sometimes they're a little bit light on the science and, and uh, we really wanted to put together a science-based conference that brought together not only the science but the art of grass finishing into one package and that's very important to us is that the recommendations that we make are based on good sound science along with the art of implementing that science in the field and that was one of our overarching goals of doing this conference. And, and the one thing I'd like to point out is, is that the Virginia Forge and Grassland Council uh, is, uh, is basically uh, an organization that's made up of producers, agricultural producers. It's a nonprofit organization. And it's also made up of agribusiness leaders 
Uh, we work with a lot of different uh, organizations and agencies in an effort to bring forth uh, the cutting edge technical information. We work with Virginia Cooperative Extension. We also work with uh, the Natural Resources and Conservation Service. We work with DCR. Uh, we, we work with so many different agencies and people in an effort to uh, work jointly and cooperatively to bring the best uh, as far as to agriculture, as far as the technical aspects and, and so forth. And I think that this conference has proved that because the turnout, as Chris has said, has been excellent. Uh, we actually had to turn a lot of people down. So uh, it's, it's, it's a conference that we're trying to uh, keep people on the cutting edge as best we can. We, we hope to have 10 sponsors for this conference when we planned it, and we ended up with almost 20 sponsors. And, and we actually had someone come in on the day of the conference and won a table. And uh, so we're pretty excited about it. And there's lots of good industry support and agency support for this conference. And as Jerry said, building these bridges between agencies is absolutely critical in today's economic environment to get the job done. And we had excellent support from Virginia Farm Bureau, and I need, need to mention that because they really stepped up and were a platinum sponsor for this conference. Yeah. They can come to our um, Southern Piedmont AREC website. That's at Virginia Tech. If you go to Virginia Tech homepage and click on extension, they'll see a, a link for the Southern Piedmont Research Station. We're gonna post the talks for this meeting on that website so people can go and look at the slides and, and hear the presentations. Um, if they want to on our website. Yeah, if people want to find out about next year's conference or other conferences in Virginia or this region, they can come to the Southern Piedmont website. Just go to Virginia Tech homepage, click on Extension, and then click on Southern Piedmont AREC. Virginia Forge and Grassland Council, we actually have several educational conferences that we will be sponsoring and, and conducting this winter. Uh, the first one actually is going to be started uh, conducted here in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, it will identify and deal with corn silage and small grain silages and haylages, and that's going to be in December. Uh, we will have four major livestock conferences uh, this winter uh, in Northern Virginia, Southwest, and the Piedmont area uh, that will be dealing with livestock. And then we also will have three equine conferences this winter. Now, as Chris indicated, uh, the dates, the locations, and more about those conferences can be found at the uh, uh, website at the uh, Virginia Tech uh, Southern Piedmont AREC Center. My name is Anibal Pordomingo. I'm a research scientist, uh, and a specialist in beef production, and you're watching me on Farmers TV. So what I would like to see is uh, uh, more awareness of what we're losing when we're losing pastures, when we're losing uh, grazing land, and more so grazing land that has this potential of producing a, you know, a high quality, reliable, uh, and uh, tender beef. So, and that's the challenge, and that we're losing some of that. So we, I would like to pass the, the, um, the concept and um, the idea that producing enough of this good quality pastures and good quality land producing beef is a, is a nice concept. We are actually improving the diversity of our systems. We keep the diversity in the systems because most likely that's not going to be the only product that we're going to produce. And uh, at the same time, we are protecting a very vital uh, component of our ecosystems, and that's the, the grasslands and uh, the soils in these grasslands. So I think at the very bottom line, more than just beef, this has to do with, uh, with protecting diversity, protecting the uh, the soil and the landscape. I spend a lot of my time traveling around the world teaching other people about holistic management, how to improve the soil, heal the land and improve their standard of living. So it's my passion that people, young people should get the opportunity to be able to ranch and live off the land. Not only live off the land but to enjoy a good standard of living. At the moment I feel our ranchers and farmers are at the bottom of the social heap and really the rest of the world um, needs us and yet we have been discarded as second-class citizens and it's not just in America, it's throughout the world. So it's on that basis that I travel around the world telling people that it is possible to make a living off the land but we need to change the way we manage and to me holistic management enables us as humans <coughs> 
to think in a multi-dimensional way and to make decisions that are socially sound, environmentally sound and financially sound. And it's what we call the triple bottom line. We are told that we have improved seeds. I don't know where improved seeds come from when nature has been improving natural seeds for a thousand or more years and all of a sudden over a 20 or a five year period a company comes up with an improved seed but in actual fact it is not improved per se it needs more water it needs more fertilizer so if we go back to the equation of energy in energy out we're in a negative situation and we're on a losing streak so we need to think about what we're doing and change what we're doing I think we need to sit and watch nature a bit and understand what happened with the predator-prey relationship and that the predators um, kept these big herds of bison in your country and buffalo in our country together and any one that was sick, lame or lazy or didn't reproduce, it fell out of the herd and it was eliminated from the genetic pool. And that is why form follows function and the function of the animal is to reproduce an environment in which it's born and nothing else. The amount of milk it produces etc etc will all happen if you select just for form follows function. But we haven't because we've had the ability to feed bales and do all these expensive things and the money has ended up in the towns instead of back on the ranches or on the farms. So on that basis, it's much what I teach, that people don't need anything. In fact, the townspeople in the world need us as agriculturalists, and we deserve to take our proper place in society, and I think our turn is about to come. Well, I think the most important thing of doing what I'm doing, it's enabled me to have more time with family and friends, and our whole family from the two children traveling around the world for seven years are back in South Africa and most of you in America reading the press will wonder why I even bother to go back to South Africa or why they went back to South Africa but the fact is that because of holistic management and they have bought into it totally they understand that there is a future in our country even though there are problems because in actual fact there are problems throughout the world and it's better to deal with problems that you know and the multi-dimensional decision-making process of holistic management enables you to preempt any of the problems that might arise. So we are very happy in South Africa. For all the young people out there, I mean, I'm still a young person myself, just uh, all I can say is keep dreaming and yes, uh, this is good industry to work in, there's always new technology uh, and new things being brought to the marketplace and uh, you know, it's a good, good place to start and uh, I know people that's worked for our company for years. So, you know, just keep the dream alive. Yes, I do have a great job. Uh, I'm the Extension Forage Agronomist at West Virginia University. Uh, I like it because I, I like agriculture, uh, at least grassland agriculture. That's my uh, area that I've worked in for 30, 30 years now. Uh, I like the cows and the sheep and uh, things like that. but. Uh, in my job at West Virginia University, one of the things that's really great is the people I have to work with. Uh, the farmers of West Virginia, uh, the county agents in West Virginia are some of the uh, greatest people in the world. Uh, here at the Mid-Atlantic uh, Grass Finished you know, Livestock Conference, I'm able to get together with you know, my good friends in Virginia. <laughs> And so we, we have a lot of wonderful farmers here too that I've worked with over the basically 30 years. I actually farmed here in, West, in Virginia uh, almost 30 years ago uh, in Northern Virginia. So I have a lot of friends here that have uh, been a big support and brought a lot of uh, friendship and happiness into my family and life. You asked me what keeps me going in my job. Uh, it, it's the people I have to work with. No, when you get right down to it. Uh, a chance to uh, work with uh, the farmers, uh, to feel like I'm being of sub support to them, help to them, helping them uh, solve some of their problems. Uh, and they're also a big support to me because when I take some information down to the farm and say, no, hey, this is what you can do, this is how you can apply it, 
they also tell me back, okay, here are the challenges with what you're suggesting. <laughs> and so I have a chance to test my thoughts against reality uh, from the farmer's perspective. And then working together, uh, we can see how to tailor that information to work on that farm. And I, I find that very exciting. I'm working with the, the natural ecology of the pasture, uh, which I love and I'm having a chance to work with uh, my friends and neighbors and help them solve the problems that they have. So that's what keeps me going on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> One thing that's important is just being able to, to uh, get out, speak to farmers, uh, figure out what their problems are and, and come up with solutions to help them in an economical way. And, and whether that's through research that's already been done or research that we need to do, uh, that's that's what we try to do is solve problems and, and uh, come up with uh, uh, economical ways to to uh, solve problems. Whether um, we can we can do research on our land grant farms and we can make the mistakes and, and uh, suffer economically where, where multiple farmers don't have to. What's new and exciting at Clemson? Well, uh, we're currently doing research in this area looking at the benefits of finishing uh, lambs and cattle on forages and what benefits on the health properties that we may have in that product to sell to consumers. We've actually gotten some uh, research grazing paddocks renovated this year. They're up and ready to go, so we've got some nice, exciting research plans in these newer facilities and, and be able to conduct them efficiently. We've also got some great extension programs under development and ready for release, one called Grass Masters that, that allows us to, to improve, improve uh, uh, pasture management, whether you're a cow-calf producer or a grass finisher or a horse producer or a goat producer, and uh, a master cattleman program that we're about to roll out. So we've got some exciting extension programs. I think it's an exciting time that producers are very interested in the quality of the product that they're producing, and, and that really makes our job Fun. We didn't have these dense briary uh, forests because the buffalo, the marauding herds of a million buffalo would run through there and, um, and, and, you know, and, and beat down the brush and the, and the brambles and all that stuff. We don't have buffalo anymore, uh, but what we do have are pigs. And so we are trying to simulate that same periodic disturbance with the pigs. The point being that when you exclude uh, any kind of disturbance from the ecology, what you have is lethargic couch potato ecology. <laughs> so what we want is exercised ecology that succeeds to a higher plane of succession and productivity and solar uh, uh, solar conversion into biomass than it would if we suppress fire and walk away from it and just leave it and don't do anything with it. Okay? So all of you, um, you know, uh, um, conservatives can realize that that's the, that's the uh, capitalist part of my Christian libertarian environmentalist capitalist uh, mantra. Okay. The consumer is key. And that, that's... Uh, I've done a lot of talks over the past five, six, seven years of producers telling them how to do it. I was doing a conference in Pennsylvania, uh, the PASA conference, Pennsylvania Association of Sustainable Agriculture, and I gave two talks, one on ABC's of grass-fed beef and the marketing story and how good the story is and all this stuff. And then I'm driving home to Massachusetts. As I go across the George Washington Bridge, it was like a light bulb. I was saying, you know, I'm talking to the wrong people. I'm talking to the producers. I need to talk to the consumers. So at that point, I started, there's a, a restaurant in Brooklyn called Applewood that has, they have a farmer dinner, they've done three of them now, where they, they, they cook a five course meal out of our meat, paired with wine, they charge uh, $100 a plate, they do it on a Tuesday night, they fill the place, and in the middle of dinner, dinner they let me get up and talk to the consumer. And people are just rabid for the truth, for the real story, and once they get it, just get out of their way. <laughs> They're going to go into their store, demand it. You know, everybody talks about, well, we don't have slaughter capacity, we don't have distribution. All that stuff will fall into line if the consumer goes in, bangs the hand, and says, I want this. You know, a, good, a perfect example in the book Fast Food Nation, he writes about the fact that there are no GMO potatoes. And why there are no GMO potatoes is because McDonald's did a focus group, asked people if they wanted GMO french fries. They said no. McDonald's put the word out, we're not gonna buy GMO potatoes. Guess what? There are no GMO potatoes. 
I mean, the market power is tremendous. And, and, and the consumer, see right now the consumer has got so many stories. They get the Joel Salatin story, they get the local story, they get the free range, they get the organic, they get this, it's totally confusing. But if they, if, they, if they eventually learn the grass, 100% grass story, then, and, and the pieces of the story are no mad cow, no E. coli. The E. coli one is huge. People just don't understand. The, the uh, you know, front page article last couple of weeks ago in the, in the New York Times was about E. coli and this lady that got it, and she's in a wheelchair for life and all of this. Well, Cornell did the research years ago. If you take the cattle off, feed, off the, off the grain feed, fed them hay for five days at the end of this, before this harvested, 80% of the E. coli goes away, the bad kind of E. coli. If you leave them on for two weeks, 90 some percent goes away. The fact is that the, the, for the, the E. coli is naturally occurring, but it needs an acidic environment to proliferate. You feed grain, you create acidosis, E. coli takes off. You feed them grass like they're supposed to eat, I mean, I have bar graphs. You can see the E. coli in the grain fed, and there is a bar, but it's like you can hardly see it in the grass. So talk about a public health solution. You know, right now we're doing research on irradiation of meat. On Merck, I'm sure, is trying to develop a shot that you can give cattle for E. coli, but it's so simple. You can get the, the E. coli out of the spinach, just take it out of the cattle. So these two guys, uh, Dale McCusker and Ronnie Wetzel, between them, I think they've got something in the neighborhood of 75 years of experience cutting meat. Um, these guys know it all. They can do bison, beef, deer, pigs, sheep, goats, what have you. And they know how to cut it, they know how to cook it. So they really, they're meat professionals. You can see Dale's using a couple different knives here. Why don't you hold that one up real quick, Dale? So that's a, a good large, you can cut a nice steak he, out of that in one He cuts good corn night. in all season. <laughs> <laughs> Dale's now going to cut some short ribs out. We actually cut this up at the shop because you, had to, you can't really get through the rib with a knife. You had to use a bone saw to, to pull it apart. This is probably my favorite to eat. Put it in a crock pot with some homemade barbecue sauce you make up yourself and let her set all day till she come off the bone. Just knock your socks off. It's good eating. Here we are back in Harrisonburg at T&E Meats where it all started. The live animal came in on a trailer, was housed in the back lot, broken down into the primal cuts, and then taken down to Stanton at the conference center where it was broken into the finished cuts. Well, there you have it, another Meet the Farmer TV. Thanks for joining us for another Meet the Farmer TV. And please let each of our underwriters know you appreciate their support bringing you Meet the Farmer TV. Check out their websites and tell them personally you appreciate their support underwriting Meet the Farmer TV. Meet the Farmer TV is made possible by Planet Earth Diversified, Melly Productions, and Leslie P. Jenkins Photography and Graphic Design. t and &E Meets, Clemson University, West Virginia University. In the Kitchen Magazine, serving the community and everyone who loves good food. Culpepper's Channel 21, helping to preserve the agricultural history of Virginia. And Flavor Magazine, serving the Piedmont's local food and wine culture.